Oh, you know, she was up first. I'm going to grab it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think it's wonderful what you did to have the dogs not outside anymore. M my concern is what are those owners doing with the dogs they used to have tamed outside now? Do they have them in crates in the basement? You know, it depends. We talk to some of the owners and it's just kind of like an affirmation period. A dog that's used to living outside is going to take a little while to get them to come inside. You know, crate train them. You know, so we, we definitely as animal control have to be an avenue for them. Mm -hmm. So we try to look, you know, get them into crate training. We also have a, a training class that starts April 2nd to help people. Yeah. You know, yeah. So we, yeah. we, we definitely have to be the avenue to go. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry? Yeah, go ahead. I'm done with it, yeah. I actually have two questions. Um, so these laws, all these laws and ordinance, only count for within the city limits, right? In the Sterling Heights, correct. Okay. And the other thing is, um, I know some states have a uh, leash law where a dog can only be on a leash, even if you didn't have that ordinance, that they can only be on a leash for a certain amount of hours during the day. Does Michigan have that law over no, all Michigan? No, there's nothing that regulates how, many, how long your dog can be tied outside. Um, but what we did do is say, if your dog is going to be outside, um, it, you know, and you were leaving, because you can't just say, well, I'm home, so I'm home all night, so the dog's going to be outside all night. No. There's a time limit on it. So, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, dogs come in. You can let them back out, go to the bathroom. But, you know, at that time, the dogs have to come back in. Because that's how people, you know, and I hate to say it, but that's how people try to manipulate the law. Mm -hmm. You know, right. Mr. Ober. Jeffy, uh, is, uh, what's the definition of inside? Is a garage a, a locked pen? With no, because the state house? law says that a uh, garage cannot be used as a shelter. Okay. Um, so, you know, inside meant inside your home, right. and not your garage, not your shed, inside the living quarters of your home. Right. So it could be your basement, it could be um, your upstairs, whatever it's going to be, but it had to be in your living quarters, you know, habitable space in your house. So that was a good question. Yeah. Any, other, any other questions? What do you do then? We're done. Can I ask a question? Sure. We've one. taken in a dog that lived its first seven years outside, like in a sand pit. I don't okay. Know, Jane. And he's part German Shepherd, mostly husky. He's big. People are scared of him. He looks like a wolf, all that stuff. So the, we went and took him away from this bad situation he was in. He's been in foster care almost a year, and he still, if you take him in the house, he just like spazzes out. So the people who have well, they work with a trainer or somebody to we have we have, and he still to this day. Well, and so they ended a up. Real the, exception to the rule. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what I mean. And he, he has this big. They, the people who foster him, they'll probably end up keeping him. They built him this beautiful, high enclosed area with a dog. But he just, you have to like, if you put him on a leash to go for a walk, but he sees you heading to the house, and he just digs in and he, he just. And so that's it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to conclude my stuff right here. And I'm just like, you know, at Sterling Heights, we also increased all the fines. So they, the base of the fine is $500. Oh, that includes your dog license. It's $500. Oh, um, and we gave everybody an amnesty period. And we also kind of um, did a huge dog license campaign. So you'll see these flyers around. And it's, you know, you're more than welcome to take them free. And then we'll turn it over to her. Right, and you guys are all set. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dana Kennedy, and of course you can never do a PowerPoint if you don't put pictures of your animals on there, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm from the U, well, not necessarily from the UP, but I'm currently living in the UP. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of us, but we're the Upper Peninsula Animal Welfare Shelter, formerly Marquette County Humane Society. Um, we changed our name because of all the negative connotations that we were getting. Yes. <laughs> okay, so... If I'm in anybody's way, just let me know. We can't talk about reducing surrenders if we if we don't at least touch on some of the excuses that people give. Um, and we've been we've probably all been in the business a long time, and we are all tired of the excuses. But I think it's really important to point out that um, most of them are legitimate excuses, and we can work towards um, helping people keep their pets. But sometimes we just can't fix them all. So. Um, here's the top 10 excuses based on the National Council for Pet Population Study and Policy. And really interesting that dogs and cats are, are 
kind of similar in the reasons that they're relinquished. Um, so let's look at the top, or one of them, not necessarily the top. Uh, moving and other related issues. More than half of the people that brought in a pet because they were moving also reported behavior problems. So maybe moving isn't the only reason that they're bringing their pet. Maybe they could potentially you know, talk with their landlord or um, maybe they have other options, but maybe they're just tired. <laughs> my dog chews through walls and I lost my last three security deposits and um, I'm not gonna do it again. So um, also young people are the most likely to admit a pet for moving, but I don't want anybody to say young people shouldn't have pets. I'm a young person. Um, I've been a responsible pet owner since I've been 18, and um, I think it's really important that we understand that young people do move. They do you know, get jobs and go to college, and, um, but I think it's really important now that with, with us doing our jobs, we're actually teaching young people. Um, and they're becoming more and more proactive. They're becoming more interested in animal welfare initiatives. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, does anybody have a shelter near a college town? Mm -hmm. You do? Yeah. How many of your volunteers are college students? I'm gonna I'm gonna bet at least. I would I'm I'm gonna guess more than half. I don't think so. No. 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 But we're starting with COVID. Uh, we probably have 200 students um, from NMU, and those are the more regular ones. You know, they come in every Friday when they have class off. You're in Ann Arbor. Yeah. I mean, you have a big thing. She's up in the UP. We're the only thing around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is nobody else up north. Yeah. yeah. So there's nothing else to do except for volunteers. That's what Jeff said. Well, you know, we talked to the hunters. I said, you can't talk to hunters in the UP. They won't be for that. And there's too many of them. You kick. <laughs> Um, behavior issues is the number one reason for dog admits, and the number three for cats. Who knew that cats were so hard to take care of? <laughs> <laughs> I always thought they were easy, right? But it's the number three for, for relinquishments of cats. Um, single pet households are actually less likely to give up for behavior, um, probably because they're easier to deal with if you only have one bad pet, right? Mm -hmm. And then length of ownership also came into play, and a little bit later I'll touch on just the human-animal bond and the idea behind it. Um, but dogs that were owned less than six months had a higher rate of being relinquished, and cats that were owned between one and two years had, a, had the highest. So, a little interesting, I thought, when I was doing this. And then personal problems. Ugh. Somebody had a baby. Those babies. Chill. <laughs> Somebody died. Um, I developed allergies after 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all hear that, right? <laughs> but um, number one reason for cats and number three for dogs. So, um, and also 17% of the people that uh, relinquished in this study actually still had some pets in the home. Interesting. Yeah. And then a third also reported other problems for dogs, behavior problems, <clears throat> and for cats, too many. Um, I don't know how that many. I mean, we see that occasionally, but not as often as, as these guys did. And then let's look at who's coming into our shelters. Dogs intact. Mixed breed. They were only in the home for a short period of time. They were over six months old when they were obtained. Um, they were obtained for little or no cost, and they were more work than expected. And for cats, it's intact, prior, no prior vet care, and they were more work than expected. Again, I thought cats were easy. <laughs> Um, but little myth busters on the side, even though dogs were at a um, higher risk for relinquish relinquishment if they were obtained for little or no cost, dogs that are given as a gift are less likely to be given up. And price had no effect on cats. So um, I know our shelter does a lot of, you know, pick your price, <laughs> take them, <laughs> that one, get one, <laughs> and, you know, all, all those. Um, and I know that we had a little bit of problems, you know, somebody in the community said, you're going to see more cats, or not according to this, which yeah. is nice. <laughs> and then who, what are the people like? I actually had to write this one down because I forgot. Okay, so males. 
Yeah, we got a couple. Raise your hand, guys. Third higher rate of relinquishing pets. I know. Males. Uh, ages 20 to 24. Anybody in here 20 to 24? We're all a little bit older than that. All right, next highest, next highest is me. Um, 25 to 29. And then it goes down with age. Um, so 20 to 24 year olds, yeah, bad people. Bad people. Um, also people uh, that didn't, or didn't graduate high school or didn't go on, those are bad people too. <coughs> They're admitting pets at a higher rate. And then um, another really interesting thing they did was they, um, they wanted to get a feel for how people knew or what people knew about the animals. Um, and one of the questions they ask is, is a dog better off if she has a litter before she stayed? And a lot of people that were relinquishing a pet said yes. Most of them did. Most of them said yes. Just goes to show we have a lot of education to do. <laughs> how? <laughs> but people don't know. I think the vets used to say that, like when I was a kid. I think they said that. Well, and that's what's going to be good about that 20 to 24 year old age group. Yes. And then the 20, you know, we're going to. Yeah, we're going to, yeah, we're going to start to know in a couple years, I think. Um, and then, of course, uh, I wanted to touch on the human-animal bond because I think that's where a lot of us, you know, we, we see these people coming in and, and we think, how could you get married? How could you do it? And a lot of times it's just a breakdown in the bond. It doesn't mean that they don't love their pet. Um, most people really do love their animals. Most people are really good. So prior to relinquishment, a bond is usually strained. Um, and of the pets that remain in the house, look at that. Most of them have been around longer, they're older, they're well-behaved, and they're easier to care for. So again, that's just kind of, you know, maybe they do have personal problems and maybe they are moving, but there's something with that bond that's not necessarily there all the time. Um, and of course, a weak bond, you know, they're not going to go through the trouble of, of moving with a pet. They're not going to go through the trouble of um, taking allergy injections, you know, things like that. And then again, most people do really struggle with the decision to relinquish a pet, no matter how much we see, <laughs> we get frustrated. Um, most people really are inherently good and they want to keep the pet. So just two examples of a relationship. Um, the one on the left, basically a lack of, lack of knowledge, lack of training. And then look what happens. You know, they don't know what to do with their dog, the dog misbehaves, and now they're just frustrated. And something happens in their home, and now they're just done. And then, um, just on the right, I always like to, to advocate for training. I think training is really important, even if it's cats, or just education, any type of education. Because if the owner knows how to deal with it, they're gonna be, be really, really pleased when the animal does something they want or does something they've been working towards. They feel good about it, the animal's better for it, and it's just that nice, mutual, happy relationship. Okay, so I'm gonna take a couple of minutes. How much time do I have? Yeah, plenty. Uh, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to maybe get some ideas, throw them out there, um, what your shelters are doing, because I am here to learn as well. So, um, let's, Let's identify why. Um, I'm sorry, now we know why. We know what is coming to us. And we know who's bringing. Unfortunately, we can't really do anything about those three. <laughs> we really can't. You know, no matter how much I try to change my husband, I can't. Um, no matter how much I try and be younger, I can't. Uh, yeah, so, so um, but any, any ideas? I'd like to like to get sure. In defense of the uh, men, especially the <laughs> older men. <laughs> Thank you. You know, uh, somehow or another, I think in many instances uh, that responsibility just falls to oh. the man of the house. Uh, nice observation. Nobody. Yeah. Uh, Never thought of that. Nobody wants to bring the dog on dog in. That's whether true. it's a good and the reason, woman might cry too much. Whether well, we get a lot of people crying, <laughs> men. Uh, so. Yeah. So that that could be a little 
plant. It's possible. It's possible. Um, so what are you guys all doing in your shelters? Sure. You know, um, with ours, like one of our main missions is to help keep people with their pets. So if somebody actually calls us and they say, I have to give up my animal, I notice with some other rescues, they're like, okay, well, here's the form. This is what you do. That's not what we do. Our first question is, okay, why? What's going on? Okay. And I tell them, our goal is to help you keep your pet. So I'm here to help provide advice. If that doesn't work, then I'll give you some other questions. But I always have to tell them, let's go this route first. Start your counseling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Big, 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 big. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, though, um, that I have that on the later slide, is that sometimes, depending on your organization, when they call, they've pretty much already made up their mind. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you can't try, but don't feel discouraged if they say, I've done all that, even mm -hmm. though they haven't. Especially too, if they're bringing them into the shelter, they've made the decision. They've made the decision, process, yes, and it's really hard to get them out, but yeah. at least we can try. Yeah. Um, any others? Does anybody have any things something? Right. Well, I was going to say financial. We, we what, what kinds of financial? Well, we have uh, a, an agreement that we don't really publicize to the public, but we have a deal with You're all the taken. vets. I know. Okay. Again, they. Um, <laughs> but we have a, an agreement with all the vets that if people come in, and their dogs be medical and they have no money, um, that um, if they say, well, I can't afford it, so I'm going to have to get rid of my dog, we leave it to the vets, and then they will. We they have a limit that we set upon the vets. Uh -huh. And if it's over that, they'll call for approval. But, I mean, yeah. just even with spay and neuter, or if it is a medical mm -hmm. issue, I mean, that has helped immensely with that. And, and people go, you need to tell people. We're like, no, no because we're they can afford it. And this way, the vet sort of knows their customers who can afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy with 20 price, so you, you know, hunting dogs, right. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants the cheap stuff. And the vet's like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. There's got to be a way to screen those, though, because there's people out there that would just use that. Yeah. Well, that's what there's I mean. One that's why bunch. we do not <laughs> publicize. There's one much. in every bunch, yeah. no matter what we do. We do low cost, um, too, and, and no matter how much you try and screen, there, there's always one there that, is. that yeah. you know, puts, oh, they, they show their income, but it's not theirs. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of a negative. We're, 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 we're talking about ways to discourage people or, or how we can help or them can help. not give up their animals. One of the things, our goal is uh, to be a no-kill shelter, as uh, you know, and uh, we do about 7,500 animals a year. Uh, so, uh, so we have a, a, a large turnover. We always identify the people when they come in. Many people come in because they've heard uh, that we're no-kill, you know. And, uh, uh, and uh, but we always identify that there's no guarantee uh, that uh, uh, your animal will be adapted out. No guarantee. Does in, that help? In some, absolutely. In many instances, people say, well, I'm not leaving my animal here. You know? uh, and we offer those other uh, support kind of uh, things as well. You know, where we can help them, as some of these people have indicated. Absolutely. Anybody have any really good things that your shelter is doing to reduce the number of animals you're seeing? Anything for strays? Does anybody have any? Oh, we're doing. What are you doing? Yeah, we just, uh, cats, you know, are a tremendous problem. Uh, uh, probably 65% of the animals we take in are cats. Uh, we're doing two things. We've, we've just expanded our population of service by 530,000. And uh, so, in previously, uh, we were really a very full service organization, and uh, we would pick up people's cats, you know, and bring them into the shelter. So we will no longer, and we heard a lot about that this morning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't bring in squirrels. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, uh, we will no longer be picking up cats, but we will accept any cat that uh, people bring into uh, our facility. And we are we have a hundred thousand dollars committed to uh, TNA. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. That's going to help tremendously. Yeah, right. Okay, so some ideas I was hoping was were going to come up, but I didn't hear them. Um, so you programs, behavior helpline or classes. Um, I'm not lucky enough to 
be able to work for a shelter that is able to have behavior classes. I'm, I'm a dog trainer at heart. I love training um, because I think it's the most important thing that we can do for dogs. But um, even if somebody calls, you know, make sure staff has the resources to answer those. Um, I think it's really important. And um, the ASPCA behavior.org um, has practically everything you need to know to, to help a, an owner with behavior problems. Oh, so if, yeah. if you guys don't know uh, a lot about dog behavior or um, certain issues, um, great, and cats too. Okay. What do you say? ASPCA oh, behavior.org. Okay. Um, humane education, again, you, we're kind of responsible for the future of the animal welfare movement. So we really do need to, and it, you don't need necessarily have to be, have formal humane education, but we really do need to be out there, be in everybody's minds, be, and it doesn't need, mean we need to be educating you know, five-year-olds, it just means all over. Making sure that people know about you, making sure that they're going to come to you when they need help. Um, pet friendly housing lists, really easy to do. You just Google it, really easy. Um, doesn't necessarily help a lot of people because again, you know, half of the animals have behavior problems. And they're really not being turned in just because the person's moving. But it's something. Uh, anybody have a rehoming service? Is there any rescue groups? Have what? Yeah. A rehoming service? <clears throat> well, that's all we do. And we don't have a shelter. There you go. So when people call us, we tell them we don't have a shelter. So what we ask them to do is that they keep their, well, and fosters, I mean, being in a mm -hmm. summer community half of, in the winter, like three quarters of our population leaves. So cut, talk about fosters, you know, you've got to be careful who fosters because, you know, you yeah. can't take it away. So what happens is um, we ask people 99% of the time to keep their animals in their possession. We'll help them with anything they have in the meantime. Mm -hmm. We'll advertise, we'll put them on Facebook, uh, anything and everything. The only thing we don't like is because we do that, Pet Finder told us we can't put those animals on Pet Finder. Sure, sure. And I, I can understand. A rescue group. But if, they, like, we have a service where, service where we can that do that. Um, basically they people can look at our adoptable pets, them. and then on the bottom they're going to say, oh, you don't have what I'm looking for. Does anybody in the community? And they have to be spayed or neutered. If somebody wants to post with us, they have to be spayed or neutered, update on vaccinations, and they have to pay us a fee for the administrative costs. And, um, I'm telling you that in the last year, and we just started this, it's barely off the ground. In the last year, we could have at least, at least helped six senior animals through that. And instead, they had to come to the shelter, and then we had to finagle you know, staff, and then we had to go and, and put that one back into the foster home. But after we signed all the papers, and it, wasting, wasting our time, basically. I, I, don't, I don't understand. I've never heard of this. So what if, Basically, we just offer a service to the public, basically like a classified ad. No, I mean, what she was talking about is keeping the animals so that can't keep it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't yeah, ask so let's say that you know that you have to move for a job in two months, and you're going to have to get rid of your pet. Right. But you don't want to bring it to a shelter. Right. So you just keep it in your home, and you advertise, mm -hmm. and we advertise for you, and then you advertise, and then you're responsible for finding your pet at home. Well then, why don't they just be advertising? Yeah, I mean, what is it that they've well, done for them? Yeah. They're yeah. We're, we're, giving, we're giving them tips. Yes. We're we're putting them on our website, so which has have to come to a thousands of hits a day. The dogs out of the shelter. I know, but if they just called you and said, "I'm moving tomorrow," I can't. Like, yeah. She said two months. No, like two. Yeah. So, so if they really say, don't want to bring their animal to the shelter, that's just another option. If somebody doesn't want, like, I would never bring my dog to my shelter. My shelter. My shelter's great. I wouldn't bring my dog there. Ever. But financially, what do you want? I would find a, I would try and find a home. You know, finding, find, helping people be responsible for their own. How do you advertise your rehoming service? It's just on the website. Barely even there. Dana, so if you have a, somebody that wants, doesn't have the means to, they want to turn in because they can't afford to give them food. Do you guys give them food? We don't. We don't. don't have, you yeah, know, we're going to say, go to a food bank. We give all of our food to a food bank. All okay. our so there are food banks available, so mm -hmm. you have a resource. So that right. they wouldn't want to turn them in. Just right. Because and of course, we're going to help them any, any other way they can. Right. We can. Right. But um, um, 
also reclaiming before euthanasia. Um, this is one that I implemented a couple of years ago. Um, and basically, if a, if a person turns in a pet because they truly need to, and they ask me, well, what are you going to do with this? And we used to say, I can't tell you, I'm sorry. I, and I kind of got to think, I said, well, why the heck not? Why can't we tell them what happened to their pet? Or why can't we tell them what's going to happen? So people would call and want an update that pet was placed. And that's what they would get. And mm -hmm. it, it didn't matter if they were euthanized or whatever. That was just yeah, the standard yeah. answer. And uh, again, I said, well, why the heck, are we, why the heck not? Um, so we just have a simple check. Do you wish to reclaim this pet? Should euthanasia become mm -hmm. the only option? Doesn't happen very often where we would have to euthanize. But um, we had this beautiful pit bull come into our shelter from another county because we're an open admission shelter. And we take in anything, no matter how aggressive or sick or you know whatever. So beautiful pit bull walks in the door, lovely. Owners crying, they were gonna have to move and they couldn't take their pet, basically. And um, dog was wonderful, sat at the owner's side, healed, brought it back to the kennel, couldn't touch it for three days. Oh, yeah. Could not touch it, tried everything. Again, I'm, I'm a pretty good trainer. You know, I understand fear, aggression, kennel, you know, not even close. Could barely feed it. So finally I'm sitting and I'm like, I'm gonna have to euthanize this dog. I'm gonna have, and I know it's in my stomach. I know it is, but there's nothing, can't even take it for a walk. And just, just my phone. I'm gonna call the people. Just gonna tell them what's going on. And they came and got it. You know, I think mm -hmm. if everybody did that, mm -hmm. probably have half the animals. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 Important to street pets, get them out there. They come back and um, find a way. Yeah. Facebook website, great, but just yesterday, just Wednesday, my husband and I went, um, made flyers and posted them all over the small town, where we found a dog with a pin its leg. I know that dog has an owner. I'm going to, you know, maybe the owner's old and they're not on Facebook. Maybe they're on, they're not on the website. Um, so I just went and posted flyers and knocked on a couple doors because it's a smaller town and somebody. <laughs> Somebody knows that dog. It didn't move far. It has a pin in its leg. Mm -hmm. um, but don't don't just use Facebook and the website. Do do the things that old people like too. <laughs> like big signs. <laughs> <laughs> like big signs. Uh, and I just want everybody to remember that pets are or people are inherently good. Again, they're they're not out just because they don't like the pets. They don't want to give you these pets. Um, most of the time. And then it's our job to help the people too. So be friendly. Make sure that people are reaching out to you in whatever. And then um, make sure that you're implementing some programs and services. You don't have to do them all, but just think. Let the light bulb go on. Because <laughs> um, it would have been a shame if I would have killed that dog. Um, it was a perfectly fine dog, just not in the shelter. And then um, I also want to encourage everybody. You know, I'm running out of time. Um, to do a proposal, if you work with a board and you're one of those people that's like, oh, my board never lets me do anything, or my board's stuck in their ways, or, or even if you're a volunteer and you maybe have somebody that you're supposed to answer to and they won't let you, try and try a proposal. Um, convince them to do something different. Um, I think it's really important um, because then you're ensuring that the program is in line with the general policy. Make sure everybody's on board. Um, Get the potential problems out there and get ideas on how to solve them so you're not putting out fires if you're starting something new. Um, and then clarify your thoughts and save time for the long run. So I think I'm going to stop there. I've got a couple more slides, but they're really not important. <laughs> <laughs>